it is so cool. It is so cool to be outside um, with you guys tonight. If you guys don't know me, my name is Jonathan Trask. I'm the family pastor here. Um, so I get the privilege of hanging out a lot with the children's, which we have right over here. And, and we appreciate the noise of children, don't we? Right? Because that's, that's like the noise. That's, that's the future church. I want you to think about that. That's the future church. And one of the things, when you come here and you bring your children here and you give them the freedom to be able to play and have fun and experience the joy of the Lord while worship is going on, you may think that they're not paying attention, but check this out. Deep in their childhood memories, when they are going to be 25 and 30 years old, when the deep questions of life come up, they're going to remember, you know what, I remember hanging out outside at church playing in the grass, and my parents let me run around with friends, and it was a safe, comfortable place. So just being here with your kids, you're instructing them and you're teaching them in the good things of the Lord. Amen? All right, yeah, keep doing that. That's great. Hey, um, this summer we are going over a series of teachings, and um, these are kind of the big questions of the Bible. That's what we're going to be teaching about, the big questions of the Bible. Um, as we spun the circle in the office and got to throw darts at the board, um, I ended up landing on, that didn't really happen, that's just a metaphor, but I ended up landing on uh, the topic and the big question of, can we trust the Bible? And I have 25 minutes. So, there is so much in that uh, phrase or in that question, can we trust the Bible? 25 minutes, go. Let's see what we can kind of get to. Let's start off as we should with a word of prayer, because we're totally going to need a word of prayer if um, <laughs> God's going to allow this to come out clear and it's going to, um, you know, sink into our minds and hearts tonight for you and for me. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we thank you that uh, we get to worship you outside in the space that we're at. As we are sitting here in Huntington Beach with beautiful weather, as the sun is going down and as we look around us and see the beauty of the sky and the plants and the things that are surrounding us, Lord, uh, we praise you for where we are at right now, knowing there are so many across the country um, that don't have the ability to meet like how we're meeting right here. They don't have giant parking lots and they don't have spaces like what we have, but you have provided for us. So maybe we be eternally grateful grateful for that, and may we be completely tuned in as we um, hear from you tonight, Lord, and personally, Father, may these not be my words. Um, Father, may they be yours, and if there's somebody that's here tonight that really needs to hear this message, I pray that they just tune in deeply, Father God, and you speak directly to their heart. Amen. All right, so um, if you look yonder that way, uh, you will see hills and mountains. I come from that far off country over there. Um, I used to live up in the mountains, and I worked in Christian camping for a number of years. And one of the privileges of working in Christian camping is that you get to be outdoors actually all the time, um, fire pits and all that. It's, it's a lot of fun, but we invite children from the city to go up to the mountains, or we did. Um, and we would invite them to just partake in nature and just observe nature. And if you don't know, or if you haven't really thought of it, when you open up your Bible, you know that your Bible was written during a time where skyscrapers, freeways, cars, um, amusement parks, TV stations, radios, all that didn't exist, right? We understand that time frame of the Bible. Okay, your Bible that you read when you pick it up and you read it, the picture book of the Bible is nature right? So when you read your Bible, it's really beneficial to be out in nature because all the examples of the birds and the flowers and the trees and the grass and the dirt and all of that and the rocks and the stones, it really comes to life because you're like, wow, I'm in the place where the Bible was written. So we would invite children up to the mountains to partake in a lot of different activities and we'd teach them about Jesus and, and just about the deep truths of scripture. One of the things that we would do is that we had this incredible ropes course. And on this ropes course, there was a tree that we would call the centurion. And the centurion was the biggest tree that we had, the biggest climb, because the children would climb up the tree. It was not 40 feet. It was not 50 feet. It was not 75 feet. It was 100 feet up that the children would climb up this tree. And there was a platform at the very top of that tree that extended out about seven or eight feet. And at the end of that platform, about 15 feet past the end of that platform, Form, there was a trapeze that the children would climb up the tree, they would run off the platform, and they would try to grab the trapeze, and about 95% of them 
that tried to grab it couldn't grab it. Well, I worked at that ropes course for a while when I was younger, and I remember a lot of students going up, and this is what would happen. We'd have somebody on the very bottom, and that person's called a belayer, and because the tree is so big, they have this mechanism, this safety mechanism that they're tied into that really makes sure that the child that climbs the tree is very safe. So we'd get the kid hooked in, we would have them climb the tree, go up the tree to the top where the platform is at, and there was another staff member at the top. Now, most of the time, this was the interaction between the staff member and the child, because usually it's like a 13 or 14-year-old boy, sometimes the girls, who would climb to the top. They'd want to be really brave. They're really brave on the ground in front of all their friends, right? But 100 feet up in the air, away from everybody they know, all of that goes away. They get up to the top, they start talking with the staff member, and the staff member's convincing them that you are completely safe. You are completely safe when you jump off this platform because you have a rope attached to you plus a safety mechanism. There are two points of fail and it's impossible. These ropes can each hold up like three elephants a piece, something like that. We'd say stuff like that, right? It was somewhat true. Uh, we were just trying to convince these 90 to 100 pound kids that they are completely safe. And as we would go through and point out the safety of the rope, and we'd point out the clips that they had on them, and we would point out, you are completely safe. You can completely trust this system that is attached to you right now. You can completely trust it. That is the conversations that we would have with them up on that platform, trying to convince them that they can trust what they are hooked up to. Now. Tonight, we're going to have a little bit, a really fast conversation about the fact that this book that I hold in my hand, which we're going to go into that, this in a second, you can trust this book, because that's the question. Can we trust, trust being key, trust the Bible? But in order to trust the Bible, you need to know exactly what is the Bible and what is in the Bible. So first off, I want to explain this, and if you've been following Jesus for a while, you've been a Christian for a while, then you already understand this. But there are probably some people here that maybe aren't completely sure about what the Bible is. Let me be very clear. This is not one book written by one man named Jesus. The Bible is 66 books. It is a collection of 66 books with 40 different author, authors written over 1,500 years. Take that into consideration. 66 books, 40 authors, 1,500 years, three languages on three continents. The Bible was not just written by all one type of individual either. The Bible contains writings of poets, musicians, kings, prophets, government officials, doctors, historians, farmers, fishermen, and many more. But yet through every single book and language it was written in on all of the different continents, all 66, it resonates with one common message, and we can start right there with, can you trust the Bible? Well, let's start right there. You ain't going to find anything else like this. This isn't one book written by one group or one man. This is a collection of books. This is insight. What we'd say is the inspired word of God is God inspired the authors from all different walks of life in all different areas on this planet, from different places and diff speaking different languages, God inspired them to write a word to be communicated to the rest of the world. That's the first place. That's what the Bible is. So the question you may be asking, well, what about the, I understand that. I understand that there's all these people that perceive this thing, same thought, but maybe they reach that, or maybe it is just a collection of, of stories. Um, how do I know that the Bible can be trusted historically? How do I know that it's, a, it's not just a collection of fairy tale stories that have been collected from around the planet that somewhat resonate with good stories? Well, let me put it this way. The Smithsonian, which is an institution that doesn't necessarily lean into Christianity, would say this. They're the largest museum and research complex. They said this. The historical books of the Old Testament are as accurate... Uh, 
are as accurate historical documents as any we have found from antiquity and are in, in fact more accurate than any Egyptian, Mesopotamian, or Greek histories. These biblical records can be and are used as are other ancient documents in archaeological work. For the most part, historical events described to, that took place um, and the people cited in these actually existed, right? So let's start off there. All right. We have an outside group. They look at the Bible and they say, well, for the historical stuff. Now, just to let you know, so you, when you look this up later, understand that when the Smithsonian looks into the Bible and they see the miracles, they discredit it right away because they don't believe in the supernatural happenings. But when it comes to the historical things, yeah, we're good. It's all verifiable. It's just the miracles that kind of toss it out, right? And you can kind of see the reasoning there um, exactly where they're at. Further evidence, if you need evidence of the New Testament and the life of Christ, you want to be looking for people who are outside of the Bible who speak about the Bible. So you may want to look up somebody by the name of Josephus, a Jewish historian who would confirm the existence of Christ, right? Somebody who didn't walk with Christ, didn't know Christ, but lived and did his work soon after the life of Christ and confirm the existence of Christ. Beyond that, when we think of, is the Bible reliable? Is it historically reliable? We say, well, what is historically reliable? What do we have that's historically reliable? Well, there are other ancient writers that are out there. Writers by the name of Pluto or uh, writers by the name of uh, Homer. And in these ancient writings that we consider to be historical, we can look at them and say, you know, when we look at what Pluto wrote, the earliest manuscripts that we have of Pluto's writing um, is, is within uh, a year of 1,200 years from the time that it was written. We have uh, his writings, manuscripts of his writings, but we look at a lot of different evidence and say, we can take that as historical. Or Homer, the same thing, within 500 years. And we could say for Pluto's writings, we have seven different uh, manuscripts that point back that we could say we can verify that these were historical writings and great things. For Homer's writings, we have 643 writings or manuscripts that exist, right? For the New Testament, does anybody want to take a guess if you don't already know? For the New Testament which we say that it could be estimated that the New Testament started to be recorded um, as early as 25 years, and some people can argue earlier, but majority, as early as 25 years after the happenings, say that we have over 24,000 manuscripts for the New Testament. So historical reliability, that's something that we can think of. Okay, well, let's say I can guarantee, and we can go through the historical uh, conversation about the Bible and say, you could trust the historicity of it or the history of the Bible. Well, you might say, okay, I get it. I, I can see people say that things happened. These are accurate events. But, but what, about the, what about the science of the Bible? I don't really believe in the science of the Bible. Well, I'd have you take into consideration this. Please keep in mind, before there were satellites and man traveled the globe and we started to understand exactly how the earth was made up, that it's the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 22, that states that it is the sphere of the earth. It is the circle of the earth. Prior to anybody having that knowledge as to what the earth, what the actual form or shape of the earth was, it was the prophet Isaiah that actually proclaimed that it was a sphere. It was a circle. And it was the, it was in the book of Job, Job chapter 26, verse 7, one of the earliest books or the earliest book, if you look at all of the books of the Bible, one of the oldest books, Job chapter 26, verse 7, says this, and it hangs on nothing, suspended completely in space. Now today, that's no knowledge. Back then, that wasn't known. And even today, the deepest thinkers struggle to find a conclusion for the nature of our reality that we're in. And this is kind of where the fun moments, I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd, um, and I love to think about just this concept as of recently, really even within the last decade, the last 15 years, 10, 15 years, these are some of the questions that are just starting to come up. Just think about that. History of the earth, like last 10, 15 years, scientific discovery. 
we are starting to explore the foundations of reality. And let me just walk you through something really quick. You gotta put your thinking hats on. If you were children, I'd have you do this. Do this just to make me comfortable right now. Okay, good, I'm, I'm comfortable. We're like in Sunday school. Okay, adult material. You are comprised of matter, okay? Okay, matter. Matter is made up of molecules. Molecules are made up of atoms. Now picture in your mind, if you've ever seen a picture of an atom, you usually have a center spot, right? And that is called the nucleus, made up of uh, protons and neutrons right there in the center. And then along the outside, in the pictures in your head, in your science books, you have these little things flying around called electrons, right? Now, many of us, that's the smallest known thing that we can think of because we don't want to go much deeper than that because our head starts to hurt. So let's make our heads hurt for a second. Okay, you go into that proton and that neutron. Do you know what happens when you zoom into that proton and that neutron that's in that nucleus of that atom or the collection of protons and neutrons that are in there? You dive into that and there's little tiny things and they're called quarks. And quarks are the smallest known things that we have that make up the universe. And the question would be, well, okay, if quarks are the smallest known things that makes up all of what we know matter in everything, then what are quarks made of? And this is where it's cool. This is where it's really cool. Picture for yourself an ocean of nothing. <laughs> Just space, right? What happens is that in this ocean of just nothing, and they would call it a quantum field, is that when there is a vibration or a resonance within that field, is that that resonance, that vibration within that field interacts, and it's almost like a droplet coming out of an ocean if there was sound coming through it and it pops up into existence and that's what you would call a quark. Do you know why that's cool? Because this. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God said. Resonating. Sound. The very beginning. And to me, that's powerful. That's powerful to think about when we think about the sound of God creating the universe. It, it, it's so crazy that some of the top thinkers, they look at everything and they're like, well, where, um, how, how, how did we come into existence? And there's one of the men named uh, Robert uh, Jastro that said this. He wrote a book called God and the Astronomers. He was a planetary physicist, and he said this. At this moment, it seems as though science will never be able to raise the curtain on the mystery of creation. For the scientist who has lived by faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. He pulls himself over the final rock, and he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for years. And that's right where we're at, is that we're starting to think deeper about life. And if you notice, if you pay attention, the deepest thinkers of our time are thinking about theories of an outside creation in a way. Now, they're not going to call it God. They're going to say something different, but they're thinking a ways around this God question because they just can't seem to get around it. Okay. Scientifically, I get it. Well, what about the prophetical things of the Bible? How can I believe those? Well, the Bible's filled with prophecy. It, the Bible is filled with prophecy that tells about, about nations upon nations ruling time after time. It is filled with prophecies of Jesus coming, his resurrection, and his crucifixion. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, it talks about the destruction of the temple. And then all of us may say, well, yeah, but those, what if, those were prophecies put into the Bible, as many skeptics would say in the past, and say those were prophecies put in the Bible after the fact to prove who Jesus was. Yes, I, you may say, hey, you have an argument. You had an argument until recently in 1947. Anybody ever hear of the Dead Sea Scrolls? 
People say these prophecies about Jesus were added after the fact, right? Because if you're talking about a prophecy of Jesus, these were added after the fact that Jesus walked on the earth and did the thing he did. So they went back in, they changed everything to look at, make it look like they zoomed forward and looked ahead to say, look at all the prophecies of Jesus, right? Say they tricked you. Uh Uh-uh. Coolest thing. Look up the Dead Sea Scrolls if you haven't seen the, or haven't heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Incredible way they were found, by the way. It was a shepherd boy who was looking for a sheep or a goat. He tossed a rock into a cave to see if goats were in there, and he heard a crash, and there was clay pots that broke. He went in there, and he discovered these ancient manuscripts. You know the date of these manuscripts, especially in the Old Testament, Book of Isaiah? Me and my wife got to see these about 15 years ago, actually up close in person. It's cool. They were in San Diego. 1,200 years prior to Christ, same prophecies, 1,200 years. Okay, all right, history, science, prophecy, but wait a minute, I'm like, where can you go, right? (laughs) Wait a minute, what about the wisdom of the Bible? The Bible's filled with all kinds of stuff. Can I really trust everything it says? Well, just think about it for a second. Think about it personally for yourself. Admit your wrongs is what the Bible talks about. Admit that you're wrong. Love your neighbor, love your wife, love your children, train your children, forgive, hold lightly onto the temporary things of this world because like the flower and the grass, they die. Care for others, stand up for what's right. Raise your family. There was one secular psychologist that was debating an atheist And this secular psychologist that's um, kind of growing in notoriety turned to this atheist, doesn't believe um, in God. And um, they do, his name is Sam Harris. Um, He turned to him and he says, uh, you know what, you you try to disprove God or say that there's no reason that God uh, exists and you try to tear apart everything. Now, this is a secular psychologist talking about the wisdom of the Bible, right? And he says, but you completely, you completely dismiss, and he'd use this phrase, the psychological utility of the Bible, meaning that there's just something in the Bible that's just good for people, and you're missing it entirely. You want to tear down this, and you want to tear down that, but you completely miss the message about the psychological utility of the Bible. You know the Bible talks a lot about your mind and your heart, right? It's like the main message, and it talks about guarding the mind and dwelling on the things of, that are loving and good right? Okay. Last one here, and this is just kind of for me, and there's one last little thing, and I love it because this is what I think C.S. Lewis grabbed onto. Okay, we talked about the science, we talked about the history, we talked about prophecy, we talked about wisdom. There's this one last one. I haven't really seen anybody kind of point this out, but I'm going to call this the cultural story, the cultural story of the Bible. And you say, well, what do you mean the cultural story? Let me put it this way. Um, Every story, if you ever take a story writing class, you ever take a directing class, you ever see how people put stories together, every story echoes the word of God. Every story. Every, C.S. Lewis grabbed onto this when he finally realized as, you know, as an as a Oxford professor um, and a uh, you know, study of literature, he, he realized that every single story that is out there talks about jealousy, greed, pride, anger. It talks about our position as human beings, and every cultural story out there echoes one same message, and is that we have a deep problem within us that we are trying to overcome. And if you're ever going to write a story, that's where you begin. Everything's perfect and wonderful, and it goes really bad, and there's a problem with an individual, and they have a character growth moment that usually happens at a point of self-sacrifice, right? And then after that, there's growth. That's the gospel. But that echoes in every single movie that you see in the theater. You don't believe me. And I say, well, 20 minutes away from us is another organization that believes so deeply in that part of reality that they've built an entire industry. I'm talking about Disney. $130 billion that does nothing more than put movies in the theater that echo the same story of 
jealousy, envy, pride, overcome by ultimate love and self-sacrifice, repeated again and again and again in 15,000 different packages that people buy and then buy t-shirts, right? Because that echoes throughout all of culture, right? It's the cultural story that we understand. Lewis wrote this. He said this, in his early life, uh, Lewis wrote uh, to his longtime friend. He said, I believe in no religion. There is absolutely no proof for any of them. And from a philosophical standpoint, Christianity is not even the best. Fifteen years later, after he wrote that and he came to this understanding, he wrote this. Christianity is God expressing himself through what we call real things. Through what we call real things. That's the temporary things, right? Namely, it is the actual incarnation, the crucifixion, and resurrection of God. That's what Christianity is. The one that we call God. Ultimate goodness. Ultimate love. Unconditional love. Pure joy. Complete peace. The God of the universe, as we look up, the God that made that sunset and that little wisp of cloud right there, and he allows that, that sun to shine through that cloud and allow us to see that, that and just gander at the beauty of what that is, right? That God that made all of that came down in the form of a man and showed us how to live and he showed us what ultimate love is and that is absolute self-sacrifice so here's the thing from a historical perspective you have struggles look it up from a scientific perspective you got struggles with that look it up from a prophetic perspective, really do some research on it. It's really interesting. Look it up. You question the wisdom of the Bible. I would be very careful about that one. I would just say, please adhere to it. It's the family unit and the structure that it supports. Listen to the wisdom of the Bible. Okay. And from the cultural story element, look into the, all the stories that you watch. You will identify the evil characters. You will identify the Christ-like figures. You will find the self-sacrificing moments that exist in all stories. Okay, so here's the thing. Let's go back to that hundred-foot tree. We've climbed to the top. We're at the top. We're hooked in. Okay, you can trust this book with all areas of your life, but here's the question, and it's the same question with every single one of those kids. They could no, 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 no in their minds. They could feel it on their back. They could be anchored in. They could be locked in and you say, here's the thing. You have to jump. You're the one that has to jump. You have to leap out there. You have to go out there, and you have to trust. And your trust, I can't give you any evidence whatsoever, just like a kid up on a rope, I can show them everything. I can pull out a book. I can show them all the stats on how the ropes were made and how they were put together. But there's nothing that I can show them that's going to force them over the edge. It's their choice. And that same choice God offers to you. The message is simple. It's this. God is absolutely perfect. He's the God of all light. He's everything that is good, that is holy, that is wonderful. We are not. We are sinners. He asks us to recognize his goodness, to turn from the evil things that we do, to look to Jesus, to believe in who Jesus is, to understand that Jesus showed us how to live and paid the price for our sin on the cross. And God says, when you understand that, I want you to believe in me. And if you haven't done that tonight, there's going to be pastors here to pray with you, pastors who want to speak with you. And we want to do that tonight and when we close in song. Now, for all the Christians that are out here, the believers who've been walking with Jesus for many years, many of you may say, well, yeah, I, I trust Jesus. I know I do. Well, here's the thing. How much do you trust him? How much are you willing to leap? What's the thing that you're afraid to do? Who's the person you're afraid to forgive? What's the thing that you can't let go of? Because the Bible is very clear. Unconditional love is what was modeled for us. Unconditional love. Love without anything attached to it. 
anything that anybody has ever done to us that has been wrong, we are to forgive them and let it go, knowing that God has forgiven us of all the things that we have done. And as believers, we struggle with that constantly. My challenge for you is this. If there's anything in your life that is hard thinking about your faith and saying, I don't know if I could do that, God. I don't know if I can make that leap. I don't know if I could jump. I promise you, I promise you, and I promise you from my own testimony, I have come from, uh, I came from a broken home, 11 siblings, uh, three dads, two moms involved in the whole thing, and I'll tell you what, I have a wife who loves the Lord. I have children that were raising in the light of the Lord. I can tell you, from coming out of areas of darkness, the only thing that has kept me alive and safe from the darkness and the things of this world and has brought me great joy and has taught me the truth about who God is and the reality of who I am, which is a sinner in need of salvation from him. This book, this book can completely be trusted. And if you want to have more conversation with that or about that, I'd love to talk with you. Michael, will you end us in a song as I pray for us? Father God, I thank you for everybody who's out here. I thank you for everything that you have um, given to us, Lord. How easy is it that we forget, Lord, who you are? We forget the, the truth of your word from every single angle possible, Father God, that we can explore your word, knowing that it has withstood the test of time and criticism, Father, over and over and over and over again from every single angle. If we have doubts, allow us... Father God, the room to explore some of those doubts with you, Lord. But in the areas where we simply just fail to trust what we know to be true, push us, Father, push us to the edge and help us leap into your arms. In your name, amen. Amen. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714 891 9495